Tonight, we'll be focusing on the legal system and how effective policy are becoming a vital part of mitigating and adapting to a warming planet. So just like all of our climate science on TAPS, we will be talking a lot about science, uh, the science of climate change, but we'll also be focusing a lot of attention on how this impacts legal challenges like Juliana versus U.S. and efforts within the Washington State Legislature. So this is going to be a really interesting event and quite honestly, completely outside of my depth. So I'm excited to learn probably more than anybody else in this room. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to go ahead and just first acknowledge that we have a great lineup of panelists tonight. Uh, we've got Sean Munger here. Let's give it up for Sean. We've got Luann Thompson here as well. Luann, a fan favorite. I love having Luann at these things. And then we also have Representative Joe Fitzgibbon here as well. So thank you so much. We had a great group of folks to talk about not only science, but law and policy. So it's a trifecta. Um, with that, I want to go ahead and introduce our first speaker tonight. So Sean Munger is a consultant, speaker, and attorney working at the intersection of law and climate change. Sean holds a PhD in environmental history from the University of Oregon. I'm not going to hold that against you. <laughs> and a JD from Tulane Law School. After practicing commercial law in Portland for many years, Sean returned to school to study history and ultimately developed and taught a course at the University of Oregon on the history of climate change. Now he works with business clients, helping them to understand how to deal with climate change issues. He enjoys cooking, music, wine, doesn't everybody really, and, uh, and movies. And he also writes fiction in various genres. I'm excited to learn a little bit more about the fiction later. So, without further ado, I want to welcome Sean Munger to the stage. Sean, come on up. One thing I do want to point out, though, before Sean gets started, is that uh, everybody at your table, you have a 3 by 5 card. You actually have several 3x5 three, three cards. If you have questions about the presentation or about anything related to policy and law around climate change issues, please write your questions down. We will have a moderated Q&A directly following the presentation. After, your, after Sean speaks, we'll, we'll just wave your, your cards in the air, wave like you just don't care, and one of our volunteers will come and pick them up and we'll feed them into the presentation. And of course, if, if you have a question at any point throughout tonight's program, you can write your questions down and just flag down a volunteer, all right? Great, so let's go ahead and get started with Sean. Thank you, thanks very much. Thanks everybody for uh, coming out this evening. Uh, great to see such a great turnout. Um, we're gonna be talking a, a lot about history uh, and law. So we're gonna kind of go into some of the background of climate change, which is something that not a lot of people know as much about the history of how we got here as they do about what's happening here now. So uh, I'm going to start tonight by making a, a statement that maybe is definitely true, but maybe uh, unintentionally uh, ironic, which is I'm not a scientist. Um, I'm happy to be on the stage with uh, Luann, who is a scientist, and she's going to be taking some questions and uh, speaking a little bit later on, and also happy to be here with uh, Representative Fitzgibbon. Uh, and uh, maybe I'm going to give you, I hope to give you a perspective tonight that you may not have heard about, which is climate change's history. Many people think that climate change is a new thing, that it's something recent. Well, it's not new. It's not a new thing. It's not a recent thing. It has a very long history. Uh, and it has very deep historical roots. Um, at the University of Oregon, as, as Sean said, I developed and taught a course on the history of climate change. And when I was developing that course, I realized pretty quickly that I was going to have to, in order to understand our current episode of anthropogenic global warming, that I had to go back and talk about the whole history of the Earth's climate leading up to that. So you can't just start in the Industrial Revolution and just plant a stake there and go forward. You got to talk, you got to at least understand what happened previously. Um, so in my class, we talked, the title of the class was Climate in History, and we talked about climate throughout history. So we talked about the ancient Near East, 
the collapse of the Mayan civilization, uh, which had to do with climate change, the Greenland colonies in the Middle Ages, the year without summer of 1816, that was the subject of my dissertation research. Um, so when you zoom out basically on this macro level, what you see about climate change is how closely it's linked to the concept of modernity. Modernity meaning how we, uh, uh, how society and civilization has organized itself really since the Middle Ages. So uh, that's kind of really where we are going to start here, at least in a, in a kind of broad sense, is the Middle Ages. Uh, in the Middle Ages, climate was thought of generally in the same way as it had been in ancient times, in classical times. Uh, well into what we call the early modern period, uh, that would be roughly the beginning of the 16th century up until the mid-18th century, up until the Enlightenment basically. Uh, educated men, and they were men, who read a lot of classical literature, they generally believed that climate was the same across the world in similar latitudes. So that's what they thought. And then in 1492, a fellow named uh, Chris took a little trip. Uh, Colombian exchange, that's what we call it in environmental history. Spanish colonization of the New World, the, basically the contact between the old and the New World. And that really changes just about uh, everything. So when the conquistadors came to the New World, they started doing their thing. Uh, in, this is in the late 1400s, early 1500s. Scientists and geographers in, back in Spain were continually baffled by the fact that uh, uh, they found places at certain latitudes that were either hotter than they expected or colder than they expected. Or, uh, most inconveniently, they often found native peoples living in these places that their classical ideas of climate told them no one should be able to live. So basically what happened when the uh, New World was uh, colonized by Europeans is it really shattered that old classical understanding of climate and how climate worked. So why am I telling you this? This had, what does this possibly have to do with carbon emissions? Well, it's all about context. Remember I said there's that broad historical context that we have to know before we can understand uh, our modern experience of climate change. So this, what I'm talking about right now, this is the historical experience that informs climate thinkers in the Enlightenment. And I've got to talk about the Enlightenment. For one thing, it's in the title of the presentation, so I have to talk something about it. Uh, perhaps you've heard of the Enlightenment, uh, rich white guys wearing powdered wigs, sitting around in Baroque parlors in Paris debating the rights of man. Okay, we all know that. Um, well, they also talked a lot about science. The Enlightenment was largely uh, about science as well. So Enlightenment, we're talking basically mid to late 18th century. The idea was gaining traction that the climate of Europe had quote-unquote moderated since ancient times. So, meaning Europe was getting warmer. Why? Because of deforestation and cultivation of lands. Notice what this is. Anthropogenic climate change. The idea that the climate, not necessarily globally, but at least regionally, at least a regional climate was changing, mainly as a result of human activity and getting warmer as a result of human activity. So also Enlightenment thinkers like David Hume uh, also believe that civilizations were basically determined by climate. The highest achievement of civilization, as far as they thought in the 18th century, had been uh, classical Greece and Rome. That's not surprising considering that that was the source of their education. Uh, all educated people read the classics from Greek and Rome, and they thought, well, this is the highest that we can ever get in civilization. And they thought that that pinnacle of civilization was a result of the moderate climate in the Mediterranean in Greece and Rome. Uh, so um, the idea was that the temperate climate of these places produced this sort of cultural intellectual flowering. Climates judged to be too hot, like that of Central Africa, or uh, Central America, or to coal, like what they call Lapland, Finland, basically what we call Finland today, 
Uh, these climates were blamed for supposedly lesser developed civilizations that were living in those areas. In other words, societies, these, these lesser civilizations were societies that were morally destined to be dominated by Europeans. So note here the implicit justification for colonialism. And there is a specifically racialized component to this kind of climate thinking. So the Enlightenment is important because uh, in a broad macro sense, it was the cause of anthropogenic climate change. And this is kind of hard to get your head around, but uh, this is uh, uh, really how it works. So the Enlightenment is the basis for everything we know in the modern world. Our systems of government, our technological uh, progress, our economy, absolutely everything we know in this world today came out of the Enlightenment. So here's briefly what we got out of the Enlightenment. We got, for example, a scientific revolution. Beginning in the 17th century, every branch of science from astronomy to zoology experienced major advances, amazing advances in this period. Uh, not just through technology like uh, thermometers or microscopes, all of which were invented in this period, or at least perfected in this period, but also forms of thinking, research, sharing scientific knowledge, patterns of replication of knowledge were coming out of, were, were uh, being revolutionized in this period. So think of Isaac Newton, Christian Huygens, people like that. You're, you're basically you know, classical enlightenment scientists. That's what they were doing in this period. So we had scientific ideas. Then we have political ideas. John Locke, as you see on the screen, uh, people like Rousseau and Voltaire, they influenced generations of political leaders like Thomas Jefferson or James Madison. So that came out of the Enlightenment. Then also we have economics. Adam Smith, who's there on the left, he wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776. This is a philosophical, but also an economic treatise on capitalism. Eventually, a cornerstone of the political idea of liberalism, and I, I'm talking about liberalism in the philosophical and historical sense, not the way that we refer to liberalism in the modern political context, but liberalism as it was espoused in the American and French revolutions. So, just thought experiment, what do you need for an industrial revolution? Not that these things are planned, they're not, but let's just think about the prerequisites for a modern, a pre-modern society taking stock of itself and deciding, you know what, we're going to develop an industrial and uh, technological basis. Well, first of all, you need the science. You need to know how to build stuff, right? That came from the scientific revolution. You need economics. You need a way to figure out how to accumulate the capital to pay for building all the stuff you're going to need. And you need a political and a social order that not only permits this, but actually incentivizes it. And this is exactly the political and social order that came out of the Enlightenment in the form of the American and French revolutions. Of course, Britain, one of the leaders of the uh, Industrial Revolution, did not have a revolution in that same sense. However, uh, something called the Reform Act of 1832, many historians identify that as Britain's equivalent of those kinds of political revolutions. So I put it to you that the Enlightenment put all the pieces, all the intellectual pieces in place for an industrial revolution that transformed Western society based on technology and capitalism. So really, the Enlightenment, if the Industrial Revolution is a product of the Enlightenment, you could say, you could argue, that climate change is an unintended consequence of the Enlightenment, just as it is an unintended consequence of the Industrial Revolution. Okay, so uh, the discovery of anthropogenic global warming, this is a very complicated topic, as I'm sure you can gauge from this slide. Um, I spent the better part of a semester on this, uh, and I've only got a few minutes to communicate it to you here today, but uh, on this slide is a good way, I think, to conceptualize how this worked. 
It's really sort of, uh, I call it the chain of discovery. So the discovery of uh, climate change and its link to fossil fuels. This was not a eureka moment, like the discovery of penicillin, for example. It was developed over a very long period of time with each new advance basing itself on what had come before. That's the way the history of science really works, structurally. And this is how science progresses. Stepping stones from one uh, stepping stone to the other or from one link in the chain to the other. So, a chain of discovery, and we start uh, way over there on the left with John Tyndall. John Tyndall was a British scientist, uh, the father of, uh, sometimes credited as the father of the greenhouse effect. In 1859, while studying the radi radiative properties of certain gases in the atmosphere, he made the discovery that carbonic acid, what we now call carbon dioxide, traps heat to a greater degree than other gases do. T.C. Chamberlain, 1899, head of the U.S. Geological Survey, nice beard there, by the way. Um, he was very interested in ice ages, as most climatologists were in this period. They were very obsessed with what caused ice ages. And uh, Chamberlain did a lot of theoretical work on how carbon dioxide works its way through uh, the atmosphere and the oceans. Essentially, he laid the groundwork for what we call the carbon cycle. Next, Svante Arrhenius, Swedish scientist, uh, Swedish electrochemist, <clears throat> actually really, really important in the history of climate change. <clears throat> he wrote a paper in 1896, fully fleshing out the theory behind the greenhouse effect. Uh, and I think more importantly, in 1908, he wrote a book uh, um, called Worlds in the Making, which was the first scientific literature that made the link between climate change and the burning of fossil fuels and temperature rise in the atmosphere. So if someone asks you, when was anthropogenic climate change discovered, you could say 1859, you could make an argument 1896, but you certainly can say it was uh, known about no later than 1908 when Arrhenius wrote about the link between burning of fossil fuels and warming of the atmosphere. So we've known about this for 110 years. <clears throat> Next in line, <clears throat> excuse me, Guy Callender, who's a, a British steam engineer. Between 1938 and 1961, he looks like a nice British guy there, um, between 1938 and 1961, he published a series of papers on uh, CO2 and temperature. And he stated in 1939 that the rise in average global temperatures between 1900 and 1938 was linked to fossil fuel emissions. So he and other scientists like Gilbert Platts uh, in the 1950s suggested that someone was eventually going to have to go out there and measure CO2 in the atmosphere and plot it against uh, temperature rise. Plass incidentally wrote uh, something to the effect of, if at the end of the century we find that global temperatures have risen in tandem with carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere, it will be firmly established that fossil fuels cause climate change. So uh, next uh, in line, Roger Revelle, he's a Northwesterner. He was born right here in Seattle. Ravel was an oceanographer, uh, and his crucial work uh, involved the understanding of carbon the role of carbon dioxide in the oceans. Now, probably many of you know that uh, the vast majority of CO2 emitted from the burning of fossil fuels is eventually absorbed by the oceans. And it's Roger Ravel we can credit for having made that discovery. Next is Ravel's protege, or one of his protégés. Uh, his name was Charles Keeley. You remember that uh, Calendar said, somebody's going to have to go out there and measure the CO2 in the atmosphere and check it against temperature. Well, Keeling was the guy they sent out to measure that. Uh, or I should say, not out there, but up there. They installed him at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, where Keeling measured atmospheric CO2, and those measurements, of course, created the famous Keeling curve, uh, which is named after him. <clears throat> 
So next in the chain of discovery, we're finally getting to perhaps some faces you recognize. Jim Hansen here on the, uh, uh, toward the right of the screen. Uh, Hansen was a NASA researcher, originally uh, uh, started out studying the planet Venus. And he was interested in why is Venus such a blasted hellhole? Well, because of a runaway greenhouse effect. And so he starts thinking, well, gee, could that possibly happen on Earth? Well, yes, it can. And he was uh, pioneering because he used computer models, which were now, uh, computer technology had now risen in the early 1980s to enable scientists like Hansen to make very detailed models of the global atmosphere and the oceans to game out exactly how climate change is affecting the planet. Finally, on the right here, we have Michael Mann. You may recognize him or may have heard of him. In 1998, he reached into the past using proxy data, what we call proxy data, which is stuff like ice cores and tree rings, to reconstruct a record of Earth's temperatures going back a thousand years, showing a very alarming increase in temperatures and very fast increase in temperatures uh, since the Industrial Revolution. And of course, what he discovered is called the hockey stick. So that's the history, very, uh, very, very quick and dirty. Uh, and again, uh, I, I'm vastly oversimplifying this entire story because there's so much to it. And there's also people that you don't see on the screen that kind of fit in amongst these, uh, these people. But this is one way to conceptualize the chain of discovery about climate change. So uh, I'm going to shift gears uh, and I'm going to start talking about law. I am a lawyer as well as a historian, if you can believe it. And although the media focuses a lot when we talk about climate change on things like treaties and policy, the courtroom is shaping up to be a really important battlefield in our fight against climate change. Perhaps, perhaps even the decisive battlefield, uh, as you'll see in a moment. So there, uh, there is some connected tissue here between the history story and the law story. In the 1960s, just as climate change was starting to seep upward into the public consciousness, or public agenda, the first major environmental legislation uh, was, uh, to, that was to have an impact on climate change was passed. And this is, of course, the Clean Air Act, which was initially passed in 1963. Of course, that focused on air pollution and what you would think of as traditional forms of air pollution. Uh, although the legal and uh, political machinery to deal with air pollution didn't really get uh, started until the 19, early 1970s and the uh, administration of Richard Nixon, when he created the EPA. So about this time, 1960s, 1970s, uh, we, and I'm talking principally about the United States, we started to establish what you might call a toolbox. A toolbox of legal machinery for dealing with environmental problems. This is the traditional, what I call the traditional toolbox. Okay, most environmental uh, action in court comes out of this toolbox. A polluter is spewing sizzling sludge into the river next to your house. Okay, that's covered by the Clean Water Act. So you can either uh, sue the polluter based on the Clean Water Act, or you can sue the EPA to get them to take action and ask them why they gave the permit to, to the polluter in the first place. So that's the traditional, that, that's your traditional paradigm of environmental litigation. Some other good things came out of this toolbox. For example, uh, the problem of acid rain, sulfur dioxide. Huge problem, especially in the 70s. Uh, and at that time, the EPA instituted a program uh, to clean up acid rain. Incidentally, that program contained a cap-and-trade system. Uh, and the results really are impressive. Acid rain is a much lesser problem now than it was in the 1970s. Climate change, though, is a horse of a different color. When I give speeches on climate change, uh, I often tell people, and this sounds like heresy, I know, I tell people that climate change is not an environmental problem. Let me repeat that. Climate change is not an environmental problem. Climate change is an economic problem. Climate change is a social problem. Climate change is a national security problem. 
Environmental problems are the kind of problems that we can fix with this toolbox. Climate change, you need bigger tools. You need much, much bigger tools. So starting with what you know, of course there's been some attempt to upscale or scale up these tools, so to speak, to make them big enough to fit around the nuts and bolts of climate change. Uh, in 2007, for example, the United States Supreme Court decided Massachusetts versus EPA, uh, which held that the EPA was required, not permitted, but required to regulate carbon dioxide as a, a pollutant within the meaning of the Clean Air Act. So, of course, this sounds like a big victory, but in the 11 years since, of course, that has shown that maybe it's not as big a victory as we thought, because the EPA functionally is not doing that much to regulate greenhouse gases. So, as I said, this toolbox is generally simply not up to the challenge of dealing with climate change. So let's think outside the box. How can we build a bigger legal tool to address a bigger legal challenge? Well, how about the biggest legal tool that we have, which is the Constitution? Atmospheric trust litigation, that's what we call it, this is a new wave of legal action on climate change, generally divorced from narrow statutory remedies. So we're not suing under the Clean Air Act, we're not suing under the Clean Water Act, we're not suing to get the EPA to do something. In other words, it's outside the toolbox. Basically, these cases allege that climate change and its effects are a violation of basic rights, constitutional rights, and even extra constitutional rights. Does climate change violate the Constitution? Many legal scholars say yes, it does. Is a right to live in a stable climate a fundamental right? Well, it almost has to be, because what good are any other rights that you may have if you don't have this basic prerequisite to exercise them? So furthermore, the rights of young people are particularly susceptible in this regard. They're going to be around longer than anyone else to have to live with the results of climate change. And now, because they're young, they can't vote, they don't have the political access to the policies that can uh, either make it worse or to stop it. So therefore, does government action that causes or exacerbates climate change discriminate against young people in violation of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause? Some legal scholars say, yes, it does. So we're not talking just about the US Constitution either. Did you know that right here in the state of Washington, the Washington State Constitution guarantees you all a right to live in a stable climate? A state court here in Washington decided that in 2015, the case was called Foster versus Washington Department of Ecology. So your state constitution has a fundamental right to a stable climate. This is happening in other countries, too. Uh, an atmospheric trust case that was uh, successful in Colombia, for example, uh, it was called Future Generations versus Ministry of the Environment. That case found that Colombia's constitution also contains a right to a stable climate. The Inter-American Court on Human Rights issued a, an advisory opinion in 2016 finding that the right to a stable climate is a basic human right. Basic human right. Not one granted by a constitution, not one granted by a statute, not one created by a legislature. A basic human right. So if you see the potential here, you can see uh, where we might be going with this. So this is the big one. The Juliana case in uh, federal court has been in the news recently. Uh, in 2015, an organization based in Oregon Park called Our Children's Trust, filed a lawsuit in the district court of Eugene, Oregon, uh, on behalf of 21 plaintiffs, all under the age of 21. The defendants are the EPA, uh, the Department of State, Department of Energy, various other federal uh, uh, governmental agencies. Uh, President Trump was recently dismissed as a uh, the defendant in this case. The claim here is that the federal government violated the constitutional rights of these kids by causing climate change. Okay, not by neglecting 
climate change. Not by not doing enough about climate change, but by actually causing it. For example, uh, by uh, uh, subsidizing the fossil fuel industry, by permitting refineries, by building out, deliberately building out our national infrastructure, energy infrastructure based on fossil fuels, going back 50, 60, 70 years. And they did this with full knowledge, full knowledge of what was going to happen. Yes, the government knew the effects of climate change no later than 1965. President Lyndon Johnson was briefed on climate change in 1965. He did nothing. So there are 21 uh, youth plaintiffs in this case, and of those 21, 12, more than half, are uh, from the Northwest. The lawyers are mostly from, from the Northwest, so this is a very local uh, issue. Um, one of the plaintiffs is uh, Jim Hansen's granddaughter. You saw Jim Hansen, uh, the guy who testified in front of Congress in 1988 saying that uh, climate change is, or global warming is happening. Uh, I am personally involved in this case. Our Children's Trust, the organization that's running it, is a client of my consulting practice, Centric Law. This case has survived numerous procedural motions by the government, including motions to dismiss. This is all public record. You can read about it. All the uh, pleadings and, and uh, major documents are online. Uh, it was originally scheduled to go to trial beginning next week, October 29th, and it still might. Uh, we'll know this week the government filed a last-minute appeal to the Supreme Court begging them, begging them to shut down this case. Pretty extraordinary request, legally speaking. Uh, the case is technically stayed, but it won't be for long. They're probably going to rule in the next few days. Incidentally, you might think in a case like this, or in other numerous, there's other climate change cases working their way through the courts against a number of defendants, you might think that defendants in these cases might argue denialist positions, but they haven't. It's very telling that at every single opportunity, despite every single opportunity to argue this, not a single defendant in any climate change case in the United States, in any court, has ever argued that climate change is not real or that it is not caused by human activity. Not once. So the issues in these cases are not climate change is real versus no, it isn't. Every single defendant in every single case, including oil companies, including the Trump administration, every single defendant has stipulated on the record that they accept the scientific consensus on climate change. So this is not climate change is real, no, it's not. This is something different. The plaintiffs in this case are not asking for money damages and they're not seeking enforcement of a federal statute the way that most environmental litigation goes. Instead, what they want is for a court to direct the federal government to embark on a court-monitored plan to decarbonize the U.S. economy as, and stabilize carbon emissions as fast as possible. This plan exists. It's out there. It's called the Deep Decarbonization Pilot Project, and it's wholly feasible now. It does not depend on stuff we haven't invented yet. It's wholly feasible right now. So even if this case is derailed, and it well might be, maybe as soon as this week, possibly by the Supreme Court or by some other court, that's not the end of it. Okay, other cases like Juliana are in the works in various federal courts and in some state courts as well. Um, a, a recently, a big one was just filed in Florida, for example. So this legal strategy is definitely not going away. So this is where we stand, basically. Uh, admittedly, this is a lot of ground to cover, and I've oversimplified things, but hopefully you can get a flavor, um, a sense of uh, some of the, uh, 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 the basics here. We can address the nuances and your questions uh, uh, for me or for uh, Luann or Representative Sigibbon, but I'm happy to take those questions, and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Sean. That was really interesting. Um, I have so many questions, but I, I think we want to make sure other people get a chance to ask questions as well. So, uh, yeah, huge thank you to you for coming up to tell us all about, uh, about the legal challenges. Uh, at this time, I want to remind you all that if you have questions about anything John, sorry, Sean shared with us, please fill out 
one of the comment cards, the three by five cards on your table. We'll have a volunteer coming around to pick those up, uh, to add those to our Q&A. So please make sure that you do that. At this time though, I do want to invite our other panelists to the stage to join the conversation. Uh, first, I want to welcome Luann Thompson to the stage. Luann Thompson is a professor of oceanography at the University of Washington. She has a PhD from MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution joint program and is a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. She teaches courses in fluid dynamics of the ocean and the atmosphere and interdisciplinary climate science. Her research is focused on the role of the oceans in climate variability and change, and in recent years is examining the impact of these changes on ocean extreme events. There's been many of those recently. She's the mother of a college senior. Wow, I can only imagine what that's like. Uh, I teach them. <laughs> uh, who, like the students in oceanography and climate science at UW, that she interacts with on a daily basis, is grappling with what climate change means for her future. So very pertinent to, of course, what Sean shared with us. So let's welcome Luann Thompson to the stage. Um, I also want to represent uh, uh, I also want to welcome Representative Joe Fitzgibbon to the stage. Uh, Joe was elected to represent Washington State's 34th District in 2010. He chairs the House Environment Committee and sits on the Agriculture and Natural Resources Committee. Climate change is his top legislative priority, and he has sponsored many bills to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and fight climate change, including multiple carbon pricing bills. And, you know, I always try to add a little bit of flavor to my descriptions of our panelists and he didn't provide me with anything so I, I went to the internet uh, thinking that maybe I'd find something interesting about Joe. And so it turns out never Google a politician on the internet. It's full of he stuff. So um, I, I'm not going to tell you anything that I, that I read. But I do want to welcome Joe to the stage because we are really, really happy to have him here today. So welcome Joe. Let's give him the stage. All right, so we have our panel here. I'm going to go ahead and give you a microphone as well. And actually, you should have grab that one too, so we can go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and black out this screen so no one's blinded. Oh, let's get a good tug. All right, so um, while you guys are getting your questions together, I have a couple of questions to get us started. I I appreciate you all being here. Uh, so first of all, I, I want to just offer you the opportunity, if you have any comments that you want to share, have you seen Sean's presentation? Joe, you anything, or Lou? Uh, it was great. It was great to, to, to get that sort of concise summary of, of, of where climate science has been and, you know, and where we are now. I think I sort of knew bits and pieces of that, and it was really helpful to tie it all together. Um, uh, so yeah, thank you, Sean. Yeah, I guess a comment that I made when we were going over our presentations is how striking it is that this is a product of the Enlightenment and then those line of white men along the way that were found in climate science, and yet the impacts of climate change is really happening to people who sort of are not in power. And that was something that really struck me about the presentation. A chain of white men with strange hair. Yeah. <laughs> and beards, yes. And strange facial <laughs> All right, yeah, really interesting. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, you know, I think that having just looked at the presentation, I mean, the first question I had uh, for, for Sean actually had to do with uh, what just recently happened in the Juliana versus U.S. case. I know that the Chief Justice John Roberts stepped in to consider a stay in that case because I, I believe they, the U.S. government said it was going to be too expensive for them to, to litigate. Uh, and, and I've heard from sources and from reading that that's a fairly unusual step. And so I wonder if you could speak to that, how unusual that is, and what that might mean for the future if it ends up in the Supreme Court. Uh, well, it is extraordinarily unusual. Um, the relief that was requested by the government uh, is very rarely granted by the Supreme Court or by other courts. They already tried it once. Uh, in July, they made this exact same request in almost exactly the same words to the Supreme Court, and it was uh, quickly denied. The only difference between now and then is there's been a change in membership on the Supreme Court. 
Um, so basically what the government has requested is that the trial be shut down because it's going to be too long and too expensive and will hamper the uh, uh, functioning of the uh, governmental defendants. Uh, of course, that's nonsense. Uh, you can read uh, the brief that was just filed, I believe it was last night or perhaps Sunday night by our Children's Trust in response to that argument by the government. And really what happened was that the government uh, greatly mischaracterized what the case is, what it's about, and uh, the uh, effects on it. Um, the vast majority of evidence in this case, the witnesses that are going to be called in this case are not going to be really fact witnesses that are going to be giving new facts on the stand. The evidence in this case is consists almost exclusively of documents that are already in the public domain, that have already been out there for a very long time that anyone can find, and witnesses are going to be asked mainly to authenticate them, which is essentially a technical process. So uh, there's really very little to uh, uh, behind the government's uh, request, at least legally speaking. Now, politically speaking, of course, is uh, a different animal, but um, in, if we're talking just in terms of legal mechanics, the chances of the government succeeding on this motion are extraordinarily remote. Now, I'm just saying that as a legal matter, as a political matter, it may not be that simple, but I'm not a politician, so I'm not going to speak to that. Well, we have a politician here. <laughs> No, actually, I, I did have a question maybe that you could uh, respond to, Joe, and, and that's, you know, obviously we're talking about uh, climate change and um, addressing climate change is becoming a, a national issue, obviously, or it has been a national issue, and I'm just wondering how Washington can sort of drive that national conversation around climate change and, and maybe what folks in, in uh, Olympia are doing in that regard. Yeah, great. Well, so uh, Washington is one of the farthest along states in terms of addressing climate change, which is like, we've done almost nothing, but we've done, that's more than like 45 states. Um, California is the acknowledged national leader on addressing climate change, and that's great. Um, and everybody else, you know, is, is, is way behind California. Um, Washington has started to take some limited actions, but um, we have the potential to move way forward to move to pass some really aggressive policies that are in, you know, in line with things that we've seen out of California, out of Hawaii, out of some other states that have really prioritized uh, addressing this problem. Uh, and partly that's because, you know, we are a large state. We do have, you know, 100 million tons of CO2 equivalent each or give or take uh, each year from our state. And that's a significant chunk. It's about half a percent of the global total which is one of the things that we hear from uh, politicians in Olympia who are trying to fight state climate action. They say, we're just half a percent. So what, you know, so we're gonna devastate our economy in order to, to get rid of half a percent of emissions? Well, of course we know that it, climate action doesn't devastate our economy and that we're accountable for the pollution that we provide, right? We don't, that we contribute to the atmosphere. We don't say, oh, I threw some trash out my window, but it was just one piece of trash, right? That's, that's fine. And that's kind of the, the analogy I make to why Washington needs to be accountable for, responsible for the 100 million tons of CO2 equivalent we put out each year. More importantly than that, however, um, is how we can show other states and other subnational jurisdictions around the world that climate change can be fought, that we can reduce emissions to a safe level in a way that is, is, is mutually supportive of economic uh, health. And uh, that is something that uh, every time an environmental policy is proposed, I'm sure you've heard this, we always hear it's gonna kill jobs, think how expensive it's gonna be. We hear from the oil industry, the coal industry, whoever it is that's most impacted, how, how devastating it will be economically. Never happens, never happens at the federal level, never happens at the state level. And we can show that. We can show that we can reduce emissions from the transportation sector without making it impossible to get around our state. We can reduce emissions to zero from the electricity sector uh, and still have the lights uh, turn on when you flip a switch. So that's what I think we can do. And then one area specifically that I think Washington can really lead the way on, and I, I compare us to Denmark, because we're about the same size as Denmark. Um, and Denmark led the world in addressing climate change by pioneering wind, elect wind powered electricity. 
Um, and that, uh, we wouldn't have a wind industry that is as far along and is as cost effective and is as ever present in the global electricity mix as we do today if it weren't for Denmark's leadership on wind and several you know, businesses as well as government leadership in Denmark. Washington can find, we need to find that niche that we can do that, make that same contribution with, that we can show the world how it's done. And the thing I think it is, and I hope, you know, it could be something else, but the thing I think it is, is aviation. Washington, where, where Boeing is based, and where Alaska Airlines is based, and a major multinational hub out of SeaTac Airport, aviation emissions are the fastest growing slice of emissions um, worldwide. As more and more people can afford to fly, um, planes are getting a little bit more efficient, but not nearly enough, not nearly as fast as the growth of air traffic is, is, is uh, taking off around the, around the world. Um, and I think that Washington, because of the aerospace sector here, because of our you know, passion for protecting our, our state and protecting our air and water, uh, and because of the abundant um, potential sources of renewable fuel to make that biofuel, that's what I'd love to see. It's for Washington to be the Denmark of aviation biofuels. Yeah, so several of our audience members have submitted questions that have sort of the same basic theme, and kind of in response to something you said, Sean, you mentioned this idea of uh, a, a human right to a stable climate. And I, that, that idea of a stable climate is an interesting one. I'm kind of, before I get to you, I, I want to bring Luann into the mix and just um, wonder how you respond to this idea of a stable climate. What does stable mean when we think about the history of this planet? Huh? <laughs> okay, maybe even just short, the history of human um, beings on this planet. Yeah, I mean, I think that we're talking about the stability of the climate system since the Industrial Revolution and how human civilization have grown. I'm not sure if I'm the expert on this. Um, we expect climate swings from year to year, like we experience El Nino in our part of the world, that snow pack at, at snow quality fast pass we know depends on what the state of the tropical Pacific is. But we anticipate a certain climate variability within a range that we're used to and that our ecosystems are used to and that our agriculture is used to. And I think, you know, quantifying that in terms of how many degrees of temperature change we have or changes in precipitation so is probably difficult, but we're looking to have a climate that's not outside of the extremes, and particularly on the high end for temperature. That, that's, that sounds reasonable. I'm wondering, Sean, in response to that, do you, is that really what we're thinking about when we say stable climate? Well, yes, I, I, I think that is, I mean, we're talking about a range of stability. It's not that it's pegged to one specific thing that remains unchanging over time. One of the things that gets lost often in discussion of past climate changes, because many people will say correctly so, that, well, climate has changed in the past. Only in a couple of very, very rare events has climate on Earth ever changed as fast as we are changing it now. Yes, there have been changes, but they've happened within a fairly narrow range and over extraordinarily long time frames. Now, the exceptions are somewhat disturbing because there are exceptions like what they call the Permian-Triassic extinction event, which we believe was caused by a major uh, and very sudden episode of extreme volcanic activity, Siberian traps or Deccan traps or uh, whatever those sources are. So when climate has changed in the past, so far as we can tell, as fast as it's changing now, it often results in fairly catastrophic consequences as far as species extinction and ecosystem stability. So I think in a, a, a very uh, fundamental sense, when we're talking about what is a stable climate, I think a bare minimum would be not that. <laughs> I know what I want, it's not that. It sounds like my daughter, actually. So, that's um, so one of the things, uh, actually, just to go back to you, Joe, you, you mentioned this idea of other countries uh, learning from examples in this way. You mentioned Denmark, and I thought that was a really interesting one. Um, I'm wondering from the standpoint of both policy, but also in terms of legal issues, can we learn things from other countries around the world where they're doing things that may be perhaps more progressive than, than we're being here? What do you think about that? Well, 
Yeah, I think that there's some areas where, where other parts of the world are way ahead of us, and there's some areas where we actually are starting to, and when I say we, I think, you know, I'm going to define we as the West Coast, because that enables us to take credit for some of the things Oregon and California and British Columbia are doing. Um, in Europe, certainly, they uh, the design of their cities is conducive to getting around without petroleum-based vehicles. They still use a lot of petroleum in Europe and a lot of other liquid fuels, uh, but um, the design of their communities is uh, enables people to use bikes and walking and transit in a way that isn't um, achieved by any cities in the United States. The, even the cities that are the closest to that, New York and San Francisco, are, are still not where uh, <clears throat> Paris or, 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 or Copenhagen or Amsterdam are. Um, those are great lessons to learn from. There are, um, on, in the area of liquid transportation fuels, I actually think that we on the West Coast, and again, Washington is the furthest behind of our peers, Oregon, British Columbia, and California, all have a policy in place that's a pretty innovative policy, and that it's actually better than the comparable policy in Europe, a low carbon fuel standard, which requires oil producers of liquid transportation fuels to gradually reduce the carbon intensity of their fuels over time. Um, so for petroleum, for an oil refinery, they could either start to refine biofuels at their plant and mix that into their to their fuel, or they can buy credits from another uh, supplier of cleaner transportation fuels somewhere else, and that's how they comply. This is a policy, California was the first jurisdiction in the world to, to pass this, and this is the thing I'm gonna try the hardest to get done uh, in, the, in the 2019 legislative session. Um, Europe has a comparable policy that doesn't have as robust of an analysis of what the indirect land use effects of those fuels are. So whereas in California, uh, they're using farm waste powered, refined with solar and wind power to make transportation fuels with very low carbon intensities. In Europe, they're importing a lot of palm oil from Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, where which results in deforestation and, and you know doesn't actually have a net uh, greenhouse gas reduction. So there are some areas of policy where uh, there are other countries around the world that are way ahead of us, and there are some areas where where we can lead the world. And I think liquid transportation fuels is a part of that. Um, finally, there's um, you know some some parts of the world just due to their I don't want to say luck, but their circumstances they have a lot of feedstocks for cleaner uh, production of fuels. Brazil is an example where they have a massive sugar industry, which has its own environmental downstream impacts, but the sugar industry produces a ton of sugar waste, which is refined into ethanol fuel at a very low carbon intensity. There are environmental impacts of that besides the greenhouse gas impacts, but the greenhouse gas impacts are very low. Now, does that mean I think Washington should start growing sugar cane so that we can produce our own fuel? No. Um, but there are things that we can lead uh, the way on to because of the um, abundance of certain other kinds of natural resources that we have here. Thank you very much. You know, you, you just said something that made me think uh, of another question, and that is, uh, you mentioned this idea of the fuel standard and gradually decreasing the carbon load. And, and that also made me think of the recent IPCC report, uh, which was, and for those of you who aren't familiar with it, was like, Ah, this is scary. So scary. That's my official scientific opinion. Um, and I, I'm wondering, Luann, I mean, you've given us some thought. You've looked at, at the IPCC report. I mean, do you think that gradual is, is what we need? I mean, do we have time for gradual? What is the science telling us about the pace we need to move at? Do you want to show the slides, or should I just answer oh, that? Well, that slide? makes it sound like we have this all planned out. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you can Why show not? the slides. Huh? Um, yeah, so I spent the, some time over the last couple of days thinking about this report in the context of our discussion. And um, those of you, it was, it was released a couple of weeks ago, um, the um, IPCC report, um, Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees C. What's the IPCC? Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is part of the United Nations effort based on the UN Framework Convention of Climate Change um, to uh, that all countries around the world, I think all, all of them did, sign on to the convention, including the United States, to avoid dangerous interference of the climate system. So um, this report says, what does global warming of 1.5 degrees C, or 
2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. And in particular, they, changed, they compared that against 2 degrees C or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, mean for people on the planet. So, let's see. Um, so I just wanted to give some highlights and then we'll address the question that um, Sean asked. One is that for coral reefs, um, and this isn't everything, these are just some highlights or lowlights, depending on how you look at it. That for coral reefs at 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, there will be fair, very frequent mass mortalities. At 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, coral reefs will mostly disappear. For Arctic sea ice, um, at 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, sea ice will remain during most summers. At 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, ice-free summers will be 10 times more likely. And then for people directly, sea level rise, and this is kind of interesting, you don't see much difference between 2.7 and 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Somewhere between 30 and 80 million people will be displaced. And we can talk more about that, that's an, that's an ocean issue. And um, for heat waves, a vast increase of the amount of um, people that will be impacted by heat waves. And this is a picture in New Delhi of people sleeping on roofs. So what does that mean about how fast we have to change our economies and our emissions of carbon? So this is a picture from the report, um, figure one in the summary for policymakers that you can download. So there's two scenarios discussed here. Um, one in which you go to basically net zero emissions in 2040. So that's net zero emissions of carbon dioxide. It's not that we're going down to 10%, we're going down to net zero. And that would include both carbon capture and storage, and storage in, in um, forests, etc. Because it really is a cumulative carbon dioxide emissions that not determine whether and when we limit the warming to 1 degrees, 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the sort of two scenarios on the left and two scenarios on the right about when we actually get to net zero carbon emissions. 2040 is not very long from now. Okay, so when we think about this and we think about what will happen, we'll peak the emissions, say we, we are really ambitious and we peak the emissions today and we start going down on emissions, eventually maybe we'll get to negative emissions where we're actually capturing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it away. But the temperature will, in, will continue to rise because even though we're getting to ne negative emissions, the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will continue to rise. And then you might have a temperature overshoot that then will come back down again. So if our target is 2.5, I mean 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, um, we would expect this, we might expect a temperature overshoot. Ideally, we would want to not have that overshoot and come back down to that 1 degree, 1.5 degrees C or the 2.7 degrees um, Fahrenheit. So I guess the answer is we've got to do something now. And the, the quote that I keep on thinking in my head is the perfect is the enemy of the good, and we've got to do whatever we can now, even if it's imperfect, to reduce our emissions. I can actually see now again, kind of right up here. Uh, well, that, that, that's, you know, I think that's really important, right? One of the things that I'm really fascinated by is how science informs both legal actions and, and policy actions. And, and, and so I'm just kind of curious, you mentioned, Sean, that this is not an environmental issue as, as you see it, but the one of in, uh, economics and social and, uh, and national security. But, but is it, I mean, how is it informed by science? Is the science critical? How does that play into these legal challenges? Well, I think the science is critical because it's the means by which we'll under, we understand what is happening and what is going to happen. So the science is, the begin, to me at least, the beginning of our understanding of climate change. It's not the end. It's the beginning. The science, uh, uh, the Juliana case, a number of the, a lot of the evidence is specifically scientifically based. We can't really get around that. And that's good. There's a question, however, as to obviously the difference between uh, 
certain degrees of warming and other degrees of warming and what may happen in those differences. But I think just like Luann said, in a certain sense, it kind of doesn't matter because we know everything we need to know right now to start taking action or to continue the action that we've taken, which is not much up till now. But we have to do this and we can't, at a certain point, with all due respect, the science, we have to stop talking about the science. We have to start talking about what we're going to do. And I don't think we're having that conversation as often or as deeply as we need to be having because we're still talking about the science. That's just my own personal view. Yeah, it's, it, I, as a scientist, I will accept that. <laughs> so, so I'm kind of curious, Joe, from your perspective. I mean, you know, hearing, of course, that, that we don't have a, a lengthy time horizon. We're talking about needing to take action essentially now. How does that impact, uh, you know, from your perspective, what do you see as big obstacles to taking action in the Washington State Legislature at, 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 sort of the, at the state level? Yeah, the, I mean, the biggest obstacle is inertia. Um, the biggest obstacle is that we, we don't have a sense of urgency among enough legislators that we need to bite the bullet and do hard things in order to s sharply reduce our emissions in the years to come. Uh, I think that that, and so politicians are a lagging indicator. Politicians, you know, the public comes around to decide that something's the right thing to do, and then it takes a couple of elections after the public makes up their mind about something before their elected officials start to also feel the urgency around those issues. Um, and I've been in office for eight years, and I'll tell you, there has not felt like a lot of urgency from my colleagues around addressing this issue in the eight years that I've been there. And it doesn't feel like it's gotten any more urgent in the eight years, even as the warnings uh, from the IPCC and the warnings from you know, even the United States government have gotten progressively more severe. I don't see that manifesting itself in the behavior of the decision makers who are holding back progress on these policies. Uh, and so the science, um, you know, there, there aren't all that many legislators in Olympia anymore who reject climate science. Most of what you hear from people who don't want to support climate action is, well, you know, anything that we do is just going to make a tiny dent and it's going to hurt our economy, so why do it? That's the, the con position. And then the pro position is like, yeah, 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 we should do that, but we got to take care of a bunch of other things first. Um, we got to take care of education first, and we got to take care of mental health first, and we got to balance the budget. And those are all important things that we do also need to do. But when those become excuses for not taking action on something that threatens life on Earth, we fail to do our job. We fail to plan for the future. And so that's where you all come in. Um, and that's where it's important that uh, that all the legislators in, this, in the state, whether, you know, even from, uh, you know, every legislator from Seattle wants to take climate action, but not that many of them will say that this is the most important thing that we have to do this year. And, and that's where the pressure um, and the sort of unrelenting pressure from their constituents needs to change that dynamic in order for us to actually get some big stuff done in the year to come. Okay, that's great. Yeah, thank you. So, so that that is really good. I mean, we're talking about uh, Luann mentioned the perfect being the enemy of the good. And we're talking about unrelenting pressure, and we had a couple of questions from the audience about 1631. And I guess I would be really interested to hear from folks here about how their, their personal views on 1631. Um, but but then um, but then, then I guess more specifically. We'll get back to you, Joe, about what 1631 might mean for putting pressure on the legislature. So, let's share. I personally am for it. Personally? Yeah, I was for it for the last one as well, and I'm for it. And that's my, that's what it was referring to, the perfect enemy of the good to actually start moving forward with something um, to get done. Yeah. Sean, do you, do you have any yeah. I mean, you're not a Washingtonian. Yeah, I, so. I'm, I'm an Oregonian, so I am not as uh, deep into this uh, subject as some of you are, but um, I'm curious to hear you. Yeah, um, 
I strongly support it. I hope you'll I hope you'll vote for it if you haven't voted. I voted for it already. I hope you'll vote tomorrow. Um, get your ballot in. Um, we're gonna need huge turnout in Seattle in order to pass this thing because it's not gonna pass in the rest of the state, and it needs to pass by such a big margin with so much turnout in Seattle uh, in order for us to be able to get the get 1631 over the finish line. I don't think it's perfect. I haven't seen a perfect law yet believe it or not, you know, and I don't think 61, 1631 is exactly the way I would have done it, um, but it's pretty close. And the function that the initiative process serves um, in states that have it, and it's served this function in Washington many times, is when there's gridlock on an issue for many years in the legislature, because politicians just don't want to take, some, take on something that's too hard, the initiative enables the public to cut through that gridlock. It's a it's a really powerful tool, and it's not something that we don't normally get laws right in the first time, whether they're passed by initiative or whether they're passed through the legislature. But a couple of important times it served that forcing function. Uh, initiative 937, which passed in 2006, to pass our state's renewable portfolio standard and require that 15% of electricity come from new renewable sources. They had been trying, the environmental community had been trying to get that law passed through the legislature for 10 years prior to that. And the last time they said, enough, we're going to the people. Um, and they went to the people, and it passed and it passed narrowly. That's something that we forget sometimes. It passed with like 51% of the vote. And so it's because people turned out strongly uh, in places that care about you know, a healthy environment, even though that wasn't directly motivated by climate change. Um, that's the biggest step that uh, we've taken so far as a state to fight climate change, is passing 937 in 2006. So it enables the public to cut through that gridlock one other example, sort of from outside the environmental realm, that I would would draw a parallel to is Initiative 502, which legalized recreational marijuana in the state. That wasn't ever going to happen through the legislature; just wasn't. And Washington voters in Washington and Colorado were the first jurisdiction in the world to say, "Politicians, you're way behind the time on this." And so, 1631, if it passes, and I sure hope it passes. If it passes, we're going to have work to do as the legislature to sort of clean it up and to make sure it works well and to make sure that, that you know all voices are heard in that process and to make sure that it's actually reducing the emissions as much as we need them to. Um, but we need it to serve that forcing function. Um, whether it passes or doesn't pass, we still have a huge amount of work to do in January. I know that the opponents of climate action, when the legislature is in session in 2019, we use whatever outcome happens with 1631 as an excuse to not move forward on more climate priorities. If it fails, they'll say, look, the voters don't care about this. If it passes, they'll say, look, you're already making energy so much more expensive. Look how much more expensive gas and electricity are gonna be, and now you just wanna pile on by, making, by requiring that more of it be renewable. So they're gonna say that either way, so whatever. It's not a silver bullet. It's not the only policy we have to do. It's the biggest policy that, it's the biggest step we will have taken as a state if it passes. And it's the only chance that you have on the ballot this fall to actually do that, to directly vote for climate action. Um, so um, no matter what happens, we still have to do more work in the, in, in the legislature. So you know, keep your legislator's feet to the fire no matter what. But um, yeah, we'll be a lot closer to, uh, to climate success. We'll just, we'll be starting to get traction if it passes. I guess that's the best thing I can say is that then we'll finally be able to point to something recent and say, look, the voters are demanding that we move forward on this, um, and that will take away a big excuse uh, from the naysayers you know, in the legislature. Great. Fair Thank you very much for that. Uh, so, you know, Luann, you mentioned, you pointed out that the, the chain of discovery was a very uh, white chain. Um, and so one of our uh, audience members was curious, this might go to you too, Sean, um, you know, we have this case, the Jimmy case, which is about children, right? But one thing that, um, that we haven't really talked about as much is the consideration to indigenous communities and how climate change affects them, especially since many indigenous communities are so closely tied to the way the, the changes in the land and the ocean and our atmosphere. So I, I'm wondering, you know, is there any thought into how indigenous rights plays into these issues? That's a great question, and uh, it does play heavily into these questions. Uh, several of the plaintiffs in Juliana are from indigenous communities. Um, there is, for example, a native Hawaiian boy uh, who is seeing the effects of climate change very starkly in his home. There is uh, a young man, and I cannot pronounce his name, uh, he's of Aztec descent, 
Uh, it's probably why I can't pronounce his name. I'm sorry about that. But uh, he's uh, uh, focused very um, closely on the relationship between indigenous rights and indigenous cultures and how they are particularly affected by climate change. So you'll see these come up, uh, these uh, issues come up in the legal documentation in the briefs. Uh, and the indigenous communities are in fact, uh, not just in the Juliana case, but in other uh, various realms in legal and also in political uh, activism are really pressing those issues from their perspective because they're, uh, in, I mean, have seen this in the political realm, for example, with the mobilization of indigenous communities against things like the Dakota Access Pipeline and uh, issues like that, where those communities are on the forefront of dealing with climate change because they are, they are uniquely affected. So that's very much in evidence in the Juliana case, and that's very much going to be a driver going forward, I think, in the legal realm. Can I make a comment on that? If, if you look at the, this report, this IPCC report that came out, they argue very strongly that making progress on this climate goal is actually also, you can do it in concert with making progress on the sustainable development goals for um, improving the lives of people all over the world. So I think they can go hand in hand, um, the indigenous rights and the developing world to improve everyone's lives. Yeah, thank you very much for that. So uh, I did have another question here, and this gets back to the Supreme Court. Um, you know, this idea of uh, the Chief Justice uh, considering the stay, and of course there's consideration of whether or not any of the other justices will weigh in on this as well. Um, what do you think uh, is uh, the, the consequence of the newest, uh, the addition of the newest member in the Supreme Court? What do you think? the consequences are there for you actually moving forward? Well, I, I think to a certain extent it makes it more difficult, uh, just because of the political calculations involved, uh, which are, uh, I think, obvious to people who are invested in these issues. I think, however, when we look at the courts, and particularly issues involving the Supreme Court, I think now, particularly in our very heavy, heavily politicized environment, we tend to look at legal developments almost solely through a political lens. And that doesn't show the full picture. What's so interesting about cases like Juliana and these other cases is that the governments and the defendants, also where the private defendants, for example, or oil companies are sued, their defenses to these cases are not substantive. They're never substantive. They're always, this is to use a term that is not a technical legal term, but many people use it as technicalities. So all of the arguments that the government has used in the Juliana case are narrow legal technicalities. Plaintiffs don't have standing, it's a political question, the case isn't right, uh, separation of powers, federalism, you know, those very kind of arcane legal matters, which are very important, and any one of them could be dispositive. But if you really look at the equities of what's going on, and ultimately law, believe it or not, is still about equity. The equities in this case so overwhelmingly favor the plaintiffs in this case that it is almost embarrassing. It is embarrassing for the government to have to argue against this case. And this is why they're fighting it and why they're fighting it with, in the way that they're doing it by trying to appeal to every court they can as many times as they can, sometimes in the exact same language that's been rejected before, because they don't have a game plan. They don't have an answer to this case. They're terrified of it because they know the plaintiffs are right. They know, the government knows the plaintiffs are right. Whether that means they'll win is another question. Uh, so the equities, I think, favor uh, what's going on here. Um, just an example that I uh, sometimes use, I speak a lot to the business community about climate change and its effects. Uh, a very a, a friend of mine, uh, David Poole, who is a futurist, he's uh, known as the CEO's futurist, and he speaks on climate change. But he, he brings up a very interesting point. He says, at what point does it become fraud to sell beachfront property in Miami? And what, no, what, seriously, at what point does it become fraud? 
Now, you talk, you, you give that question to a lawyer, and I'll say, oh, nah, nah, that's ridiculous. It's not ridiculous. I guarantee you, eventually, someday, sooner, I think, rather than later, a court is going to rule that selling property in a sea level rise prone area without disclosing that risk is fraud. On the day that court, probably a state court somewhere in Florida, on the day that court issues that ruling, the world changes. And it changes very, very fast. So that's probably gotten off on a tangent, but that's kind of how I get to see these things in a, in a, in a broader lens, I think. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. So actually, as a follow-up question, this was actually directed to you, but I'm kind of curious about the rest of you as well. The uh, question is, this is for the historian, so I'm assuming it's you. Um, are you personally optimistic? Are you optimistic about the case, and are you optimistic about climate change in general? Believe it or not, I am optimistic about climate change in general. And I know that's kind of maybe seem like an outlier position. Uh, I get this question, this kind of question a lot, and the way it's usually phrased is, do you really think that we as a society are going to take the action that we need to combat climate change? And my response is always the same. Do we have a choice? Do we have a choice? What, we're, we're just going to lay down and die in the face of climate change. I guarantee you that if one generation decides that's the result that they're going to take, that decision will be revisited by the next generation. Uh, there's a quote that I used in a, 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 um, a presentation just last week, and it's usually misquoted and misattributed. The quote, which is misattributed to Winston Churchill, is, Americans will eventually do the right thing when all other options are exhausted. <laughs> okay, Winston Churchill did not say that. Actually, the person who said that is an Israeli politician named uh, Ada Iban. He said it in 1967. What he said is that nations and humankind will eventually make the right choice when all other possibilities have been exhausted. What's going, through, what's going on right now is we're exhausting all of the possibilities. But the end point is exactly the same. So I believe we will take action on climate change because I simply think we don't have a choice. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I, I'm a professor at University of Washington, and I encounter every day young people, scientists, and others who are passionate about climate change and making the world a better place, and that's what gives me hope every day. Yeah. Yeah. So you're optimistic. I'm optimistic. Okay. Uh, I don't know that I'd say I'm optimistic or pessimistic. But, you know, yeah. um, I think that we can overcome climate change. I think that I think it's not too late, and I think that the that when the the dam breaks or when the inflection point happens, it's going to happen pretty quick. I think that we will um, feel like we've gone from a place of total inertia um, to a place of incredibly rapid change, like overnight. Um, and I think that that is, I don't want to say it's inevitable because that only happens if we make it happen. It doesn't happen just because um, that's the natural way of things. That only happens when enough people stand up and say, enough, this way of living, this way of governing is insufficient for my future, for my kids' future, for my grandkids' future, for all other species on Earth. And so um, I think that can happen. Um, I guess I don't kind of think it will happen. I guess I, what, I, what I'm not sure yet is that is that going to be, you know, in two weeks, which is the day by which you will have all voted for 1631, or will that be in two decades when it, it might actually be too late? Not too late to stop it entirely, but too late to stop some of the worst effects. So um, I do think that inflection point will happen, and it's kind of incumbent on all of us to make sure that it happens as soon as possible. I just want to add one quick thing to that, uh, a historical lesson. I am the historian. How many isolationists were there in the United States on December 6, 1941? How many isolationists were there in the United States on December 8, 1941? Not very many. Yeah, interesting. 
Well, you know, I, I hate to do this because I have a stack of cards here. I even have a question written on a napkin, which I think is pretty cool. Um, but but we, I want to be respectful of all your time and of our, our speakers' time. And we have, we have certainly gone over our time a little bit. Uh, so what I would like to do at this time is just give a big round of applause for our panelists here for coming out and sharing with you. So big thank you, and I hope that you will have an opportunity to ask them any additional questions you have in a few minutes. I hope you guys will stick around for just a little bit for that. And so please feel free uh, to ask them any additional questions. Uh, there's only really one way out of this room, so if you stop them before they hit that door, you pretty much got them cornered. Um, I guess I could sneak out the back. Um, I do want to just make uh, a plug for a couple of things. 1631 came up a couple of times. Um, what I would like to encourage you to, to do is learn more about the initiative. Uh, we have some folks back here in the back that are more than happy to talk to you about the initiative. Um, the, the pros, the cons, who's funding what and why. Uh, so I really do encourage you to, to learn more about that. And I also want to encourage you all to go to Cascadia climateaction.org to learn how you all can be involved and engaged and learn more about what is going on uh, in, in regards to climate change. And in fact, if you really uh, are so inclined, and I, and I hope you all will be inclined after what we heard tonight, go back to the Cascadia Climate Action table in the back, the Take Action table. There are a whole bunch of really cool things that you can do to take action to support uh, a healthier climate. And if so, you can just take a look at any one of the little uh, pages that are there, take a picture of the pages, um, that would be fantastic. Uh, just do something, anything, please. Um, I also want to make one quick plug before I turn it over to you. We have a, we have a guest in the back who will come up front here in a second. Um, I, I also want to make another plug, a shameless plug, for our Climate Science on Tap series. Hopefully, many of you came out last month to learn about wildfires and climate change. Our next one is about carbon farming and blockchain. So think Bitcoin. It's gonna be wild. I'm gonna learn a lot, and you will too, if you come out and join us for that. Um, but, but right now, I, I do want to, before I say my goodbyes, I wanna turn the microphone off to uh, someone who, who has a, a sort of a special request of some other action that you might think about taking. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Helen, and um, when at the COP in Copenhagen in 2009, I was representing France uh, in the negotiation team on a carbon mechanism, and since I moved to Seattle following my husband, and I was really shocked uh, when I read the IPCC report, special report, even though I've been like, I thought I was educated on climate change, but it really came to the shock. And one thing you said is just like, it's enough, talking about science, we have to take action. So uh, what I'm offering to you is to uh, petition the a Nobel Foundation to create a Nobel Prize to uh, reward action for the fight against climate change. Al Gore got the uh, Peace Prize, the IPCC got the Peace Prize, I and mean, we know enough about science. Now we have to reward people that are taking action to fight climate change, and we think that creating the Nobel Prize on climate could really uh, help raise awareness. So if you have questions, I'm here, I'll be at the uh, back of the room and I'm uh, happy to answer your question. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, I hope to, to learn more about that myself. So I do, I do want to, again, thank our panelists for coming tonight and participating. Big, let's say give them another round of applause, because I think they're doing it. Uh, I also want to thank all the Cascadia Climate Action volunteers for helping out tonight. So a big round of applause for them, too. And, uh, and, I, and I want to make sure that we thank our the, the Naked City staff for helping us out tonight. Please tip them well. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to say my goodnight now, but I do want you to ask your questions to these fine folks. And I also want to point out that we have a couple of students from the program on climate change here. Raise your hands. Okay, you kind of spread around. Yeah, 
Um, they are here to answer questions about climate change as well. So you're going to hit these guys up. If you have other general questions about climate change, you can hit up uh, the graduate students who are here as well. I want to continue these conversations tonight and then once we leave as well. So with that, I will say good night to you all. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's make something happen.